Welcome to this webinar for VISTAs on Managing Student Loans. I'm Calvin Landrum, a Training Specialist for AmeriCorps VISTA, uh, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined today by Jessica Knight and Indy Clark from Education Northwest, and together we'll be providing online support uh, during the presentation and facilitating your questions. Now, student loans can be complicated and daunting to navigate, uh, so today we're going to talk about the options you have as a VISTA that can help out with loans both during and after service. Uh, a quick note, while we do discuss the Education Award during this webinar, for those of you who want more tips regarding the Education Award, we have another webinar you can access on the VISTA, on the VISTA campus page. Uh, the link to that, I believe, is going to be in the chat. Again, I'm Calvin Landrum, and I'm from Waco, Texas. Uh, I served two terms with AmeriCorps NCCC as a field team leader and, uh, and later as a support team leader uh, on projects throughout the Midwest and Northeast regions of the U.S. Since wrapping up my NCCC service, I've held multiple, multiple positions with the Corporation for National and Community Service, uh, including working side-by-side -side with Natasha at the VMSU, who is our other presenter today. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce her. Um, from the VISTA Member Support Unit, we have Natasha Douglas, uh, a Member Support Specialist uh, for VISTA. Natasha is an AmeriCorps alum. She served with Public Allies Chicago and was placed at the National Runaway Safe Line, the federally designated national communication system for runaway and homeless youth. She earned a bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University and a master's degree from San Diego State University. Uh, so, again, I want to say thank you so much to everyone who has joined this webinar, who's attending, who's listening right now. Uh, now I'm going to turn things over to Natasha. Thanks, Calvin. Today we are going to start off by looking at the most common types of student loans. Then we will explore some specific programs to help you postpone your student loan payments during service, repay your loans, and potentially even eliminate your loans long term. At the end of the presentation, we will open up the conversation and take questions during a Q&A. Let's jump in. As a VISTA, there are three important factors to consider when thinking about student loans. First is your types of loans. The types of loans you have will impact the programs you are eligible for. The second is your decision to select either the education award or the stipend. This will impact some of your loan repayment options. And finally, the third is your future career plan. These will impact the possibility of having your student loan balance forgiven in the long term. During the presentation, we will address all three of these factors. To start out, we'd like to know what type of student loans you have and if any of them are already in forbearance. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a poll pop up. Please take a moment to fill out the poll. Do you know what type of loans you have? Federal loans, federal Perkins loans, private loans, both federal and private, I don't know, or I don't have any loans. I wish we could all be so lucky to not have any loans. <laughs> Are any of your loans in forbearance or on deferment yet? Forbearance, deferment, no, I don't know, or I don't have student loans currently. It's okay to not know or not have any loans. Definitely, you know, and a point that you make, you know, if you don't know what kind of loans you have, you know, you can always call and find out. Um, it looks like our poll is closed, so let's wait a second. And uh, Serena Porter says, man, I wish I didn't have any loans. Me too, me too. <laughs> uh, let's see, will our results pop up for us? Uh, oh, there we go. All right, so it's looking like, um, according to our poll, most of you have federal direct loans. Uh, that's what I also have. Uh, I see some people with some Perkins loans, uh, federal and private, a good mix of both. Uh, let's see, are any of your loans in forbearance or deferment? We got 45 people in forbearance, uh, 
probably through national service. Uh, we have some deferment. No, some people say, I don't even know what the status of my loans is, which is also okay. Um, hopefully it will empower you to find out today. Um, yeah, this is great. So we're gonna touch on these things uh, in just a few minutes. Well, Natasha, will you walk us through the types of student loans? Sure, many of the programs we will be talking about today will only apply to specific types of loans, so it's important that you know which types you have. Let's start off by clarifying some key differences between student loan categories. Broadly, we will be talking about either federal loans or private loans. In the case of all federal loans, funds are borrowed from the federal government and the most basic difference lies in who actually distributes those funds. For federal direct loans, the lender is directly the U.S. Department of Education. Within this category of federal loans, there are several different programs, as you can see, in the first column, including subsidized, unsubsidized, and parent plus loans. There's also another type of federal loan called a federal Perkins loan. With this loan, the lender is actually the school itself. While the government still provides the money, it is the schools and the universities that actually distributes the loan funds to the students. And finally, federal private loans are, excuse me, finally private loans are those borrowed and administered through private lending institutions. Some of these include loans from Discover, Sally Mae, or loans administered by a bank or credit union. Throughout the presentation, be mindful of which types of loans you have and which loans are eligible for the programs that we will discuss. If you are unsure about which types of loans you have, connect with your loan holder for more information. Now, for those of you who have selected the Education Award as your end of service benefit, you can put your federal student loans into a state of forbearance with the National Service Trust so you don't have to make loan payments while you're serving as a VISTA. I'll refer to this as national service forbearance. Most federally backed student loans qualify for national service loan forbearance. For example, federal direct loans and direct consolidation loans can be placed in national service forbearance. However, there are two exceptions to this. Parent loans and federal Perkins loans are not eligible for national service forbearance. Private student loans also do not qualify for national service forbearance. Similarly, if you choose the stipend as your end of service benefit instead of the education award, you are also not eligible for forbearance. In both cases, you'd want to explore loan deferment and we'll talk about that a little more in a bit. The most immediate benefit of having loans and forbearance is that you don't have to make loan payments. However, even a forbearance, or even in forbearance, your federal loans will continue to accrue interest. So another great benefit of national service forbearance is that once you complete your entire year of service, you can ask CNCS to pay off the accrued interest. There are a few things to know about interest accrual payments. It doesn't happen automatically. You need to submit a request on myamericorps.gov to have the interest paid for you. The interest accrual payment is an additional benefit to the education award. The payment doesn't come out of your education award balance, and the interest accrual payment is considered taxable income. So you'll need to report it as such and be prepared to pay the tax on the payment. We'll come back to tax implications a little later in the presentation. Note that forbearance does have its limits, so let's review a few things you'll want to keep in mind. National service forbearance is only an option if you choose the education award. Forbearance and interest accrual payment are contingent upon successful completion of your service term. If you end service early, you'll not only forfeit the education award, but also the forbearance and interest accrual payment. This means you will owe the lender for any interest that accumulated 
during your forbearance period. VISTA members who extend their service are not eligible to receive an education award during the extension period. During an extension, you are only eligible for the end of service cash stipend. Since the education award is not available, requesting a forbearance for existing loans and interest accrual are not available during the extension period. Now, let's say that you get to the end of your service and decide to stay on for three months to wrap up your project. For those three months, you're only eligible to receive the end of service stipend that accrues at $125 per month. Once you enter the extension period, you're no longer in a period of national service forbearance and your lender may request repayment. Now remember that forbearance is not guaranteed. If you've not already done so and would like to put your loans into forbearance, you can find the request form in your My AmeriCorps account shown here. When filling out the request form, if your lender is not listed, click on Institution Not Found link and follow the directions. You should expect to see your account if your request was accepted by the lender within three to five business days. Now, while we're on the topic, this is also where you would request to have the interest that accrued during the forbearance period paid after your service is complete, of course. Typically, the interest accrual payment will also take about three to five business days to process. So make sure you follow the request process and timeline carefully so as to avoid fees or late payments. A request for forbearance can be made the old-fashioned way through paper, but please be advised that it will take significantly longer to process. As for whatever reason you would like to fill out a paper request, call the National Service Hotline directly and they can guide you through the process. Now let's take a quick second to talk about a scenario that some of you may find yourself in later down the line. For VISTAs who opt to do a third term of service, you are able to receive what is called a zero value education award for your third term of service. This means that if you've already received two education awards, you wouldn't get additional funds, but you would be able to place your loans into forbearance with the National Service Trust and have the interest paid off at the end of your service term. The important thing to consider in this situation is whether having your loan interest for the year paid off by the National Service Trust would be worth the $1,500 cash stipend. If so, the zero value education award might save you more than the $1,500 cash stipend. For those of you with private federal loans, or those of you who select a cash stipend who don't qualify for national service forbearance, there is an option for you to explore. It's generally known as loan deferment. Deferment differs from forbearance in a few ways. First, you request deferment directly from your lender. Different lenders may use different names for this, so you might need to explore with them a little bit. Basically, you want to request that they temporarily defer your payments due to economic hardship created by your low income during your year of business service. Secondly, not all lenders offer loan deferment, and if you find that your lender doesn't, you'll want to explore options to lower your monthly payments. The third difference between loan deferment and forbearance is that deferment may not offer an option to pay off the interest that accrues while the loan is in deferment. For federally subsidized loans, accrued interest may be paid by the Department of Education as the loan is deferred. Check with your lender for specifics, and remember, like forbearance, deferment is not guaranteed. Now let's transition to loan repayment. Once you are no longer able to postpone your loans during service, there are several options to repay and reduce your payments. Right now, we're going to talk about these options separately, 
And then later on in the presentation, we're going to talk about ways you can combine some of these options to get the most out of your benefits. Loan consolidation is a process that allows you to combine one or more federal student loans into one new payment, loan payment. As a result of the consolidation, you will have to make only one payment each month on all your federal loans, and the amount of time you have to repay your loan could be extended. Some of the benefits of loan consolidation include lower monthly payments, centralized payments, potential for better interest rates, and access to alternative repayment plans. You can apply for direct consolidation loans through studentloans.gov. The process offers both electronic and paper options. Private education loans are not eligible for federal direct consolidation. Since most private education loans do not compete on price, a private consolidation loan is merely replacing one or more private education loans with another. So the main benefit of such a consolidation is obtaining a single monthly payment. Also, since the consolidation resets the term of the loan, this may reduce the monthly payment at a cost, of course, of increasing the total interest paid over the lifetime of the loan. For more information on private loan consolidation, visit the link that we've placed in the chat window. Next, for those with federal direct loans, you may want to consider some of the different income-driven repayment options that are available through the government. Essentially, an income-driven repayment plan adjusts your monthly loan payment as a fixed percentage of your income and family size. To qualify for an income-driven repayment plan, you need to have some degree of financial hardship, meaning that the balance on your loans needs to represent a significant portion of your annual income. Basically, they want to make sure that payments at 10 to 20 percent of your annual income would be less than a standard repayment plan. You can also enroll in an income-driven plan at any time, and your payment will only go up once your income does. If you enroll now while in service, Payments under an income-driven plan can be as low as zero to five dollars per month since this is live at the poverty level. The upside to an income-driven plan is that your monthly payments are lower, often much lower. Another benefit is that the, these payment plans are set to forgive the balance of your loan after 20 to 25 years depending on which program you're eligible for. However, one limit to be aware of is that if you stretch out the time over which you're able to repay the loan, more interest will accrue and you might end up paying back more interest in the long run. So there are three income-driven replacement plans offered through student or federal student aid. One is the income-based repayment plan, also known as the IBR plan. And there's the pay-as-you-earn repayment plan. And lastly, there's the income-contingent repayment plan, the ICR plan. The differences between, between the plans lie in the year when you took out your student loans, your annual income, and household size. There is a detailed chart found on studentloans.gov, and we'll drop a link in the chat box below. To apply, you must submit an application called the Income Driven Repayment Plan Request. You can submit the application online at studentloans.gov or on a paper form, which you can obtain from your loan servicer. If you selected the education award, once your year of service is complete, you can begin using your education award to make payments on any federal student loans. 
to start the process of using your education award through myameriCorps.gov portal. Once you completed your service term, you will be able to access the link from your home screen to create an education award payment request. You will have to access a form where you will enter the payment type, the amount authorized, and the institution where you want the payment to be directed. When you click on Submit, a notice will be sent electronically to your educational or loan institution. A record of your request will appear on your member homepage. The school or loan lender will complete their portion of the form and return it electronically to CNCS. They will fill in the amount for which you are eligible as the request is for current educational expenses. They will provide the payoff amount and loan type as the request is for a student loan. Once you initiate a request, payment generally takes place within 48 hours. Please note that the request cannot be automated, so you will have to create a request for each payment that you wish to make. If for some reason the institution denies the request for a payment, they should have entered comments explaining the reason for the denial. Any time you use the Education Award, you will need to remember that you will be taxed. So now we're going to pause and check in about tax liability. Calvin, can you start us off? Definitely. Thank you, Natasha, uh, for the wonderful overview, you know, of how to pay off your tax, or, or sorry, of how to pay off your loans, you know, some options for you. Um, now we're going to uh, go to a topic that generally raises a lot of questions for VISTA members, and that is taxes. Um, so, so as you all know, the Education Award and any interest payments made on your behalf during your service are all considered taxable income. As we move through this next section of the webinar, please remember that we're approaching the topic of taxes as it specifically relates to your education award, and we won't be able to address questions about taxes in general. We can't really give uh, you know, straightforward tax advice um, because we are not tax people. Um, so the first big piece of information to take away uh, is, again, that any use of the education award is considered income that is taxable you will be taxed on the amount that was used in the year that it was used. This also means uh, that if a year goes by and you don't use any of your education award, you don't have to pay taxes on it. Your education award is only taxed in the amount that you use in the year that you use it. So while you will need to report any, any amount of education award used when you file taxes, um, a 1099 miscellaneous form is going to generate for you if you use $600 or more in a given year. Um, so, as Natasha mentioned earlier, um, interest accrual payments are also considered taxable income and you will need and will need to be reported during the year you receive those payments. If your interest accrual payments were over $600, you should expect a 1099 miscellaneous form uh, that is automatically generated to be delivered to you. So, let's uh, take a second uh, to consider tax liability. So this is to, to have a lot of questions about this, and we understand uh, that you'd like a specific estimate uh, for your specific tax liability when using the education award. Um, but I really want to I, I really want to take a second to clarify why it's not possible for us to give a standard universal estimate. This is because your tax liability depends on several personal and situational factors. What we can show you is a list of those primary factors that impact tax liability, so you can sort of make your own estimate. So as a general rule, your tax liability will always be tied to your income during a given year. The education award is considered income, so when you use it, it will be added to whatever your annual income is for that year. So for a given year that you use all or part of your education award, what you owe in taxes will depend on the five factors listed here. The first one being your total annual income during the year that you use the Education Award. Uh, number two is the amount of the Education Award that you used. Number three is any tax credits or deductions which would reduce your taxable income. Number four is the federal tax rate. Uh, and number five is the rate is the tax rate of the state that you earned your income in. So 
to, to wrap that up, uh, your total annual income plus the amount of education award you used, along with tax credits and deductions based on your personal circumstances, gets you your total taxable income. That total taxable income amount uh, then gets taxed at the federal tax rate and taxed at the state tax rate where you earn the income. A lot, I just said tax a whole lot of time, so I hope you're following me. Um, these are just the most basic factors, but as you can see, there are many unknown variables going on. So let's take a look at how this might play out in some hypothetical examples. So let's start with a hypothetical VISTA who just finished their service in 2015. Let's say this VISTA had $10,000 of income in 2015. For 2015 and one version of this scenario, they used only $500 of their education award. In the other version on the right-hand side, uh, they used the entire education award, the full $5,775. So in both cases, they have about $8,000 in tax credits and deductions, but as you can see, the added income from using the entire education award increases the overall taxable income uh, for the member on the right. So this is a hypothetical example, but you can see how important it is to be aware of how much education award you're using relative to your other income for a given year. In this example, one had a higher taxable income than the other, but both would be taxed at the same federal tax rate um, because they you know, fall into a certain bracket. But let's take a look at how this might look a few years down the road, maybe with a different income level. So in another scenario uh, to consider, let's say it's been a few years after service, and this VISTA is now making $40,000 a year at a job uh, where they're still paying taxes throughout the year. They then decide to use their entire education award that year, the full 5,775, uh, which is added to their taxable income for that year. The total income is now 45,775, uh, and after subtracting credits and deductions from that, you can see that the taxable income of 37,775 has brought the VISTA into a higher tax bracket, uh, which means they would have to pay more taxes. Um, so again, this really, that's a very broad overview um, of taxes and, and sort of how that all works, um, but it's really gonna depend on your own personal situation to decide when you wanna use your education award. Um, you know, having lower income versus having higher income, uh, using part of the education award or the full amount, these are all things that you're going to want to consider, um, you know, when, when making decisions about your education award. Um, again, you know, taxes are complicated and personal, and one way to estimate your own tax liability, um, another way, um, is to download a recent 1040 form and estimate filling it out with your most recent tax rates uh, and your estimated information for the coming year. Uh, you can sort of kind of guess, you know, based on how much your current living allowance is, how much maybe you'll make for the entire year. Um, yeah, so when making a decision about your education reward, we suggest that you first test this out to plan for your tax liability. Uh, the 1040 form comes with instructions, and the IRS.gov website has many added resources to get you started. Uh, and speaking of resources, let's talk about those for a second. When it comes time to filling out your tax return, uh, there are lots of different programs available online and in person that can help you out. For those with an income less than $53,000, you can receive free in-person tax prep through VITA, that's the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. Um, often, the organizations that run VISTA uh, tax prep sites can also assist you with resource sharing and make sure your tax questions get answered. Uh, free file is a great online option to consider if you're looking for a quick and easy way to file your taxes. Uh, when it's time to file your return, you simply choose a free file service, uh, you know, and they, they connect you with that, with a provider, you download their software, and they walk you through your entire filing process. Um, at the end, it'll automatically submit your return to the IRS, uh, and then it's, like, it's pretty easy, you're, and then you're done. Uh, free file services are available for those uh, with a household income of $60,000 or less, uh, and we'll drop the link uh, in the chat to uh, the different programs. Uh, if you do have a lot of questions about your taxes, we do suggest that you connect directly with someone from the IRS or a tax professional. Uh, we, realize, you know, we do realize that this is a very, very important topic for VISTAs, um, but please be aware that we're not able, again, you know, to give you personal tax advice. Um, and while taxes may sound daunting, uh, there are several ways that you can contact the IRS and ask your tax questions.
Uh, the IRS.gov website has a help and resources section, a contact us section. Um, there's a number of great FAQs, uh, simulators, uh, quizzes, games, I mean, so much stuff there to help you really understand your tax implications. Um, so, and also, of course, uh, these resources are specific to federal taxes. Um, if you have questions about your state taxes, um, the best advice is to look up your state's Department of Revenue and contact them directly, give them a call, talk it out, uh, and they're the experts and they will be able to give you all the information uh, that you would need. Uh, so now I'm going to go back to you, Natasha. Thank you, Calvin, for sharing some important information about taxes with us. Now we're going to start looking ahead towards the future and the possibility of eliminating your student loan balance. To start, take a moment to think about your future career goals. Are you interested in the public sector? If so, please share what types of public sector careers interest you. Please enter your ideas in the chat box and make sure to send to all participants. All right, cool, thanks, Natasha. We'll take a second to uh, see what people at nonprofit, refugee assistance, higher ed pro, interested in joining the Department of Public Health. Oh, that's fun. Uh, social services, all right. Probably not staying in public sector for 10 years. That's okay, too. Uh, let's see, we got someone who wants, <laughs> President of the USA. Come on, Scotty, have them goals. Uh, we got uh, right. public health, art, wellness, nutrition, or yoga. Love me some yoga. Uh, someone working for the State Department. Oh, these are all excellent. These are great. Does Peace Corps count since it's federal? Peace Corps, uh, I think it kind of depends. You can get a public service loan credit for your Peace Corps service and for also working uh, at the Peace Corps agency. Uh, so, so yes, I guess the answer is yes, it does count. <laughs> uh, cool, man, these are great answers. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing, everyone. So now, Natasha, can you tell us a little bit more about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program? Sure. There are multiple federal programs that go above and beyond what the VISTA program offers that, when used in concert with our benefits, help to maximize the value of your education award. Public Service Loan Forgiveness for example, is a loan forgiveness program that encourages graduates to choose a career in public service. It applies only to federal direct loans, so if you have parent plus loans or Perkins loans, you may consider consolidating them to take advantage of PSLF. If you consolidate, keep in mind that only payments made on the new direct consolidation loan will count towards the PSLF. If you make 120 on-time full monthly payments while employed by a qualifying public service organization, the remaining balance of your federal loans is forgiven. Only payments made since October 1st, 20. 07 count because that's when the PSLF program started. The balance forgiven is not considered taxable income, so employment and loan payments don't need to be consecutive. So you could work in the public sector for a few years, then take a corporate job, and then go back to nonprofit work. Only the payments made during your time in public service employment count towards the 120 payments but this gives you flexibility in how your career proceeds. Now let's take a quick look at what types of employers qualify as public service employment. To begin, in order to qualify, it needs to be full-time employment. Public service employers include any local, state, or federal government organizations, nonprofit organizations, as long as they are not partisan political organizations or labor unions, public schools, libraries, and related organizations count too. Some more examples of public service employment that qualify include emergency management, military service, public safety, and law enforcement services, public health services, public interest law services, 
early childhood education, public service for individuals with disabilities, and the elderly. To apply for PSLF, you will need to document your qualifying public service employment as you go. So for each year or at least each time you change jobs, you will need to complete the PSLF employment certification form and have your employer to verify it. Then submit the form to Fed Loan Servicing, which is the part of the Department of Education that manages PSLF. Fed Loan Servicing will review your employment certification and let you know whether the job qualifies. Also, if your information is missing or if they need additional documentation, they'll let you know. They will also notify you of how many qualifying payments you've made. And just an FYI, for currently serving VISTAs and VISTA alums who would like to document their VISTA service as qualifying public service employment, please submit the PSLF form to the VMSU via the National Service Hotline fax. Once received, the VMSU will certify the employer section of your form based on your VISTA term information and return the form to you to submit to Fed Loan Servicing for processing. Remember to only submit the form once you've completed your term of service. After making the 120th qualifying payment, you can submit the PSLF application form to request forgiveness of the balance of your direct loans. For more details, you can look online at studentaid.ed.gov. We'll also include a link in the resources we share after this session. In combination with some of the other programs we've mentioned, it's possible to reduce the amount that you owe monthly and as a whole. Next, Calvin is going to share about how he personally made the most of these programs to reduce the student loan burden. Calvin? Thanks, Natasha. Um, all right, cool. So it's going to get real personal uh, for a second. Uh, something that we heard from a lot of VISTAs on previous webinars was that they really enjoyed uh, some personal experience with the Education Award and student loans and repayment. Um, so I just wanted to share my personal experience and show how some of the concepts and programs that we've been talking about today apply to a real person um, and what I've learned navigating this whole process. Um, so I personally use PSLF uh, and IBR to manage my student loan debt. Uh, and before serving my two terms in AmeriCorps, I had about $34,000 in student loan debt uh, that was being serviced by federal loans, uh, or Fed loan, uh, and ACS, which is like a, I think they were just a servicer for my federal loans, uh, but they were all federal loans. Um, for my time serving, for my time serving in, in, in C, um, I earned $11,195 in education award funds, uh, $2,900 in interest payments, and I was able to claim 13 months of credit towards my public service loan forgiveness. While serving, I took advantage of the national service forbearance and the interest payments to reduce the burden of living on a fixed stipend. However, if I had all of the information that I have now, I probably would have done a couple of things differently, um, but before we get to that part, I want to break down what I actually did for my service. So, so when I started, um, I had graduated college just three weeks before, uh, and my loans were already up for repayment. So I immediately put them into forbearance. I was like, you know, I don't want to pay that, I'm not ready to pay that yet. So I put them into forbearance, I took advantage of that. At the end of my first year of C, I made an interest payment to both of my servicers. Um, you know, I knew that I was going to do a second year of service, so I used my education award to make a payment also for the month between my two terms. I ended in November, I started again in January, so I made a payment on both loans for the month of December. Uh, luckily, it was only one month because before I put myself on income-based repayment, uh, both payments were about $250 each for a total of about $500 a month. 
Um, and it was really nice to have the education award to help with this payment between my periods of forbearance. So going into my second year of service, I placed my loans into forbearance again, and I didn't think about them until my year was up. At the end of my second year, I made a lump sum payment of about $10,670 to one of my servicers, uh, to ACS, and that was just to kind of get rid of my loans with them and to bring myself down only having one loan servicer, and that was a Fed loan. My reason for this was because I wanted to have one less payment each month and to generally rid myself of a large chunk of debt, um, and also because Fed loan was just more willing to work with me on payments uh, and really meet me where I was at and what I could afford. So after my two years of service in AmeriCorps, during which my loans were both in, during which my loans were in forbearance, or my loans were in forbearance during both of those years, um, you know, after my two years of service, my salary on my first job was thirty thousand um, dollars. Using income-based repayment and my lump sum payment, I was able to get my single payment with Fed loan down to a manageable one hundred dollars a month, um, a savings of about four hundred dollars. So as my salary has increased, uh, my payment amount has gone up slightly, uh, but with public service loan forgiveness, I'm still going to end up paying way less than the full balance of my loan uh, over the course of my 120 payments. This whole strategy worked out well for me, uh, but after doing a few hours of research and calling FedLoan and calling ACS and talking to the National Service Hotline, um, you know, I would definitely would do some things differently knowing what I know now. So, if I could go back with my current knowledge, I really would have only put my loans through ACS and forbearance and used, uh, and used the income-based repayment for my loans through Fed loan. Um, ACS was way less flexible with the terms of repayment, and through income-based repayment with Fed loan, my payment would have been very small, like almost zero dollars. Um, and this would have allowed me to get 12 public service learning credits uh, for my first year of service, 12 credits for my second year of service, and 12 additional credits for making a lump sum payment at the end of my two years of service for a total of 36 public service loan forgiveness credits um, for my two years of service. I could have gotten three years out of my one year, or out of my two years of service. Instead, I only made one payment over the course of my two years, and I earned 12 credits uh, from my lump sum payment for a total of 13. So I really kind of, uh, you know, gypped myself uh, out of a, almost 23 additional, you know, 23 additional months, and that's a really big difference. Um, you know, I've learned that the distinction between, er between earning public service loan forgiveness credit from paying out of pocket monthly and earning credits from using your education award is a very important difference. You can only receive a maximum of 12 public service loan forgiveness credits for a lump sum payment using the education award. So if I had been paying on my loans during both years of service, I would have received those 24 credits plus an additional 12 from my education award instead of just the 12 that I was able to get using the lump sum payment. So if you remember back on slide 22, uh, we showed you how to make an education award request. Well, this is my summary of all of my requests. Um, this is what it looks like, you know, sort of when you're done with your service and this is you know, after I made all my moves, I paid all my stuff, this is what it looks like. So as you can see, I made a total of seven requests for the use of my education award. I made four interest payments, uh, which are, let's see, the bottom four. So if you start at the bottom and go up four, those are my interest payments. As you can see, they're a pretty good amounts. I mean, that's, that's almost $3,000 in payments right there. Um, I made one lump sum payment request, uh, which is that big one, that $10,666. Uh, and I made two monthly payments, which was the 260 and the 268. Those were for the year for my gap um, in between my two years of service. Um, so you can use the Education Award to make as many payments as you can towards your loans, but don't, but don't forget, you're only eligible to receive the interest payment once for each loan that is in forbearance. My tax implications were fairly minor because even though I used over $10,000 of my Education Award at once, the income for my service year was so low that I didn't get bumped into a new tax bracket. So keep in mind that this is gonna vary wildly from person to person, so it's really important to look at your full financial picture before you make any sort of drastic moves. Um, so now, it's sort of, I ended up, I have one servicer to deal with, uh, and I use income-based repayment to keep my payments manageable while working towards my 120 public service loan forgiveness payments. 
So by using all the resources available, you know, I have a really comfortable relationship with my student loan debt, and I feel confident in my ability to pay it off with the least amount of financial burden. Uh, so, so thank you, Natasha, again, for letting me speak on my own personal experience. But I'm going to turn it back to you for a little bit um, for information on Perkins Loans. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us, Calvin. That was awesome information. For those of you with Perkins Loans, I'd like to point out some of the unique characteristics of those loans as they relate to the Education Award and Loan Forbearance. Perkins loans are not eligible for IDR or PSLS. However, for each year of VISTA service you complete, you can get 15% of your Perkins loan balance forgiven. To be worthwhile, your Perkins loan balance would have to be at least $37,000. If that's the case, here's what you would do. Select the cash stipend as your end of year benefit. You can't get the Ed Award and the 15% loan forgiveness. It's one or the other. Put the loan in deferment based on financial hardship. Then at the successful completion of your VISTA term, 15% of your Perkins loan balance is forgiven and the Department of Ed will pay off the interest that accumulated while your loan was in deferment. To learn more details about options for VISTAs who have Perkins loans, please visit the link that's posted in the chat window. Now, for those with federally backed loans, here are some thoughts on how to get the most out of what is available. While serving, you can apply for income-driven repayments and get your payments down for almost nothing. This is a great option if you know that you want to participate in the PSLF program and want to get credit towards the 120 payments without actually having to pay anything. Applying for forbearance while in service is another great option to put your payments on hold and have the accrued interest taken care of at the end of your service term. If you're earning a cash stipend, ask your lender about other programs they may have to help you manage your loans. Consider a zero value education award for future terms of service if you have reached your maximum amount of education award funds. This lets you have the forbearance benefits that come with the education award while maintaining our two education award maximum. No matter the decisions and service that you make, these benefits extend well into your life after VISTA. When your service is over, keep making IDR payments in order to receive credit towards the PSLF. Using the Education Award to make payments is a great way to help transition out of VISTA service and into permanent employment. Payments from the Education Award must be done manually each month. Keep in mind that if you are in forbearance during your service and would like to get PSLF credit, you must make a lump sum payment equal to 12 times what your regular monthly payment would be. For example, if your regular monthly payment would be $100, you would make a $1,200 payment using the Education Award to receive PSLF credit for your service. Remember, you can only receive 12 total credits from a lump sum payment. When your 120 monthly payments have been made, you will be able to apply for loan forgiveness and the PSL program that started in 2007 or rather, remember that the PSLF program started in 2007, so the earliest that anyone could reach the benefit of forgiveness would be 2017. Now, here are some immediate next steps we recommend that you take as a follow-up to this session. Know what types of loans you have. 
like take a look at the Education Award website, check with your lender if you haven't already placed your loans in forbearance or deferment, explore the income-based employment plan and the public service loan forgiveness plan. Make sure your lender is listed on nationalservice.gov. To recap, here are some of the resources that we shared with you during this session. MyAmericorps.gov, use this resource to submit forbearance requests, interest accrual requests, or associated payment requests. Use studentloans.gov um, for all things related to student loans. IRS.gov provides guidance and assistance on tax-related issues. My Fed Loan provides assistance with PSLF processing and verification. Um, you can contact the National Service Hotline if you need to submit a paper request. And lastly, you can call the VMSU for help with forbearance requests, interest requests, or other benefit-related questions. All right, um, back to you now, Calvin. Thanks. Man, that's a lot of information, I know. Um, looks like we're doing pretty well on time, so we have plenty of time you know, to answer some questions. Um, but before we get to the Q&A component, uh, we want to know what you thought about this. Um, as you see on the right side, uh, there is a quick poll where you can share some feedback about this webinar. Um, so if you please would just take a moment to answer the questions. We really want to be able to improve these webinars and your input helps so much. Um, anything that you put there comes straight back to me and I do read all those comments um, and, and I take your suggestions very seriously. Um, so please take a moment to fill that out if you can. Um, so, you know, we've given you a lot to think about and now it's time for your questions. Um, uh, we've queued up some that, that were in the Q&A that we'll start out with. Um, you know, we'll, so we probably won't get to every question, but we will try our best. Um, you know, we're really going to try to focus on questions that are likely of interest to the group as a whole um, and maybe not so specific. Um, so you can ask questions using the Q&A panel located on the lower right of your screen, um, but I'll also ask our operator Creighton to let you know how to ask questions by phone. And if you would like to ask a question from the phone, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name when prompted. To withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, to ask a question from the phone, please press star 1. All right, so while we're waiting uh, for some questions on the phone, I'll go ahead and see what we've got in the Q&A. Uh, let's see, it looks like, so someone asked, uh, can you specify what the difference between federal direct loan and a federal direct plus loan is? Um, and I will be honest with you, when I saw that question, I did some Googling really quick because I didn't know the answer to it, uh, but I do now, um, and it makes sense. So federal direct loans are loans that you get yourself. Uh, they are in your name. They are for you and your education. Federal plus loans are going to be parent plus loans. Those are going to be in someone else's name. Um, that is, you know, your parent, um, and they're also for grad students. So a plus loan is for graduate students and people getting master's doctorates um, and the parent plus loans, you know, to help their undergraduate student out. Um, and a federal direct loan is just going to be a loan that you have in your name uh, for your education. Uh, let's see, we have another question. Let's see, uh, Natasha, I think you can take this one. It says, can I change a payment plan after selecting one? Example, can I switch from income-based income -based repayment to pay as you earn after a few years? Sure, there is flexibility with it. You can just um, reapply through your lender if you want to change to something else. There are um, new plans coming out um, all the time. There's a new repay plan that um, has come out recently, so just contact your lender or lenders if you would like to switch. Thanks for asking. Yeah, awesome. Um, cool. So let's see, Wesley uh, Gooch asked a question, would it be ideal to make small payments with the education award over a period of years or to use the majority of it while your income is low? 
Um, that's some of those questions that, again, it's, it's, it's going to depend on your situation um, and really what your end result is going to be. Um, you know, if it's going to help you out to use your education award just to make your monthly payments for, I mean, for five or six years, then that's great, and you should do that um, and consider your tax implications there. Um, for me, it made the most sense, like for my personal situation, to use my education award all at once while my income was low, so that my uh, so that the tax implications, you know, weren't that great, so that um, I could get rid of a lender, um, you know, so that I could, you know, just really rid myself of that debt. That's what made the most sense for me. Um, but I have, you know, friends that I served with who are also just using the education award to make their monthly payments. Um, you know, they have pretty good salary jobs, but it's just something that they don't have to worry about. Um, you know, they just make their payment each month and it doesn't directly come out of their pocket. Um, so that's a really great question. And it, the, the answer is, you know, it depends on, on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I'm gonna ask Creighton if we have any questions on the phone. And I show no questions at this time. All right, cool. Again, you guys think you just dial star one, call and record your name, uh, and we'd love to talk to you and answer your questions. Um, let's see, what else we got in the Q&A? Let's see, if you worked at a nonprofit before but didn't pay on your loans yet, do those years count? Natasha, do you know that one? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're working at a qualifying nonprofit institution, um, the payments that you make um, do count. You would just have to fill out the PSLF form and um, work with the Human Resources Department at that nonprofit to get that form completed. And once it's certified, those payments can be credited. Right. Um, yeah, but we do need to uh, make note um, that, you know, if you, just because you worked as a nonprofit doesn't mean that you're eligible for the PSLF credits. You had to have been making payments during that time. So if you're working there and maybe your loans were in forbearance or you, for whatever reason, were in a period of deferment and you weren't making payments, uh, you won't get credit for that. You have to be in a period of repayment and actively making a payment. Even if it's $5 or $0, whatever it may be, you have to be making a payment while working uh, to receive that credit. So let's see. With public service loan forgiveness, will the principal and interest be forgiven? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so after your 120 on-time payments, the entire balance is forgiven. That's principal, that's interest, that's whatever is left on that loan uh, is gone, which is amazing. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Someone said in the chat, uh, what if you worked at a nonprofit for three years but only made 12 payments, only 12 count? Uh, that's correct. Only 12 of those payments are going to count. It's only payments that you actually made uh, while you were serving. Um, you know, and sort of that goes back to illustrate uh, my own personal situation where, you know, I didn't make payments during my two years of service, so I didn't get any credit at all for my two years of service except for the 12 that I made, uh, except for the 12 credits that I got using a lump sum payment. Um, and your lump sum payment is gonna be, so, at, so once you're out of service, um, you know, and you enter that period of repayment where you're getting a bill each month, whatever that bill is, finally, you know, even, whether that's before income base or after income base, whatever your bill is for that time, um, 12 times that is the lump sum that you'd have to make in order to get those 12 credits. Um, it's something that you need to be in touch with your lender about um, because it does require some some communication so that they know your intention. Um, you know, all it requires is a phone call and saying, "Hey, uh, I'm about to make this payment, and I want these payments to be counted towards my public service loan forgiveness." You know, I'm an AmeriCorps member. Um, you know, and this is the situation. You just got to fill them in. They know that, um, and then you know they'll be able to see that and apply that money uh, directly. Uh, Creighton, we have anyone on the phone yet? I still show no questions. No questions, all right. Well, let's see, we can go back. Let's see, uh, what do we got in the Q&A? Let's see, if your loans are in forbearance currently, is it too late to switch to IDR payments? Uh, Natasha, do you know? Um, I am not sure about that. I would okay. suggest that you contact your lender to see if you can switch. But I think that, 
you should be able to switch or um, cancel forbearance at any time and start repayment. So I think that you should have a conversation with your lender or lenders about that, and they should be able to um, point you in the right direction. Totally, yeah, and, you know, it's important to make the distinction that, you know, if your loans are in forbearance, that means you're not paying on them, um, so you wouldn't have any sort of income-driven repayment plan set up or anything because there's nothing, um, because you're not having to, to pay back on your loans. Um, so it's never too late to switch to income-driven repayment because you're going to do that once you actually start paying on your loans again and once you get out of that period of forbearance. Um, so the, the two are sort of unrelated in that one doesn't really have anything to do with the other except for the fact that in one you're making payments and you're trying to get them lower, and the other one you're not making payments at all. Let's see. Someone said, uh, so if, if we make income-driven repayment payments during our service and then use the education award, do we get credit for our monthly payments and the education award or just the monthly payment? So if we use, let me just make sure I understand that. So if we use the income driven payment to make payments during our service and then use the education award. Oh, yeah. So this is uh, the great thing is that you can get two, you can get two years of credit for your one year of service. So if you're in your period of repayment, you know, for your entire year of service and you're making low monthly payments, each one of those is going to count. And you'll also get an additional 12 credits for a lump sum at the end of your service for using your education award. Um, it's a really great benefit, sort of like a little loophole that you, you know, to help you really maximize uh, that education award and maximize the amount of credits that you can get. Let's see. Someone asked me, at Calvin, do you have an estimate of how much you are expecting to be forgiven by the end of your 120 payments and the loan forgiveness program. So, actually, if I can be uh, super honest, let me tell you a little story of what happened to me the other day, and everyone is probably going to gasp a little bit. So, when I went to re-up on my income-driven repayment, um, you know, I didn't know which income they were going to pull. Um, so, you know, I Went online, I did the thing to recertify um, what my income was, and they led me to the IRS website, which pulled up my income return for the year of 2014, um, which is when I was serving as a member, and I didn't make much money. So now my payments are $0 for the next year, which is great. Um, what's going to happen, though, is next year they're going to pull my income again, and then it's going to go back up. But I'm going to enjoy not having a payment uh, of, you know, having a payment of $0 for the next year. Um, I don't really have an estimate of how much my my uh, my loans are going to be um, because it's really going to depend on how much my loans go up, how much my income is going to be, um, you know, how much I'm paying each month. Um, so I don't really know. Um, you know, I, I, when my payment was $100 a month, um, let's see, that would be so 100. That's $1,200 a year times 10 years. That's $12,000. So that's $12,000 out of the around 24, I guess, that I had. So that's, I mean, that's a pretty, it's a pretty big chunk. That's about $12,000 that would have been forgiven, you know, if my payment stays at 100 bucks. Let's see, uh, anything on the phone? There's still no questions from the phone. Oh, no question, all right, cool. Uh, I think we got, we'll do a couple more questions from the Q&A and then we will, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, we'll cut it off in this webinar. Uh, someone says, so if you have a $0 payment, does that count as credit? It does, um, because that is technically a full monthly payment because under income-driven repayment, my payments are just added to $0. Um, if they were $1, they would all, they would all count towards my PSLF. Um, let's see. Uh, I just want you can own still be, let's see. Uh, sorry, yeah, there's a lot of questions in here. Um, all right, Natasha, I think this one's coming to you. Uh, so it says, Kevin asks, if I have my loan in forbearance for one year, will CNCS pay the interest? On top of that, if I make a lump sum payment, will I still get the 12 credits toward PSLF? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, yeah, that's a good, excellent answer. That is the answer. The answer is yes. 
Um, and that is, you know, and that is the way that you would get credit for your service year while still being in forbearance. Um, so you can be in forbearance throughout your entire service year, use your lump sum payment to get those 12 credits back, you know, for your year of service. Um, but if you make payments and you use the lump sum payment, you can get two years of credit um, instead of just the one. So that's a really great thing. Good question, Kevin. So let's see, we'll do uh, one more question. And if we don't have any on the phone, then we will wrap it up. Uh, let's see. If you, Brittany asks, if you put your federal loans into income-based repayment, will you lose the education award and interest payment from VISTA? Uh, no. So, well, let's see, if you put your federal loans in IBR, will you lose the education award and interest payment from VISTA? So if you put your loans, if, if your loans are currently in forbearance uh, and you take them out of forbearance and, you know, go into a period of repayment, the amount of time that you're in forbearance, that interest, that interest is going to be paid off. You can submit a request to have, let's say it was, you were only in forbearance for six months um, during your service and then you went out of forbearance and started doing repayment. CNCS will pay the interest that accrued over those six months. Um, you don't lose your education award, you still get your full education award at the end, um, you just only get an interest payment um, on, on the amount uh, that you were in forbearance. So, so for the amount of time that you were in forbearance, that is your interest payment. Um, so I'm going to ask one more time, do we have anyone on the phone? I assume the answer is no. You're correct, there are no questions. All right, cool. Uh, all right, wonderful. So. Thank you guys so much for all of the great questions. Thank you for attending. Um, I hope you really got something out of this. Um, and, if, and again, if you have any questions, uh, we are always here now. Let's see, Serena Porter says, I feel more confused now. No, Serena. Uh, if you uh, shoot us an email, uh, you can email me or shoot someone an email uh, and we can help you out. Uh, I would personally give you a call and answer any questions that you might have. Um, I can throw my email in here. Uh, right now, and I may redirect you, but it's right there, clandrum at cns.gov. Uh, you can shoot us an email, and we'd love to talk to you and answer any questions that you might have. Um, so uh, I want to give you some information on an upcoming webinar that we are going to be having. Uh, our next webinar is on project sustainability uh, and approach, project sustainability approaches and strategies. Uh, check out the webinar page uh, under the Connect and Learn in the Vista campus uh, for more information about that. It's going to be on April 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you want to register for that or if you have questions, you can email vistawebinars at cns.gov, uh, and we will get back to you. Uh, again, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Natasha, so much for being an excellent host, uh, excellent co-host of this. Thank you, India and Jessica, Education Northwest, and thank you all for um, for coming and showing up to this webinar. Hope you all have a wonderful day.